and welcome to Industry Night with me, Nikki Nellis, the show that takes you on a deep dive into the happenings of the hospitality industry. Now, every week I get to talk to an incredible array of talented people about their passions and professions. So a little bit about me, if it's your first time here, if you come here every week, as you should, then just like, I don't know, follow your nails or go get a drink or something. Uh, I've been covering the food, beverage, and hospitality scene for the last 20 years through a variety of outlets, print, online, TV, radio, podcasts, and social. The list are you on it.com is celebrating, I think, 23 years this year. And that's the online zine that tells you about every restaurant, opening, food and wine promo, and happening around the DC metro area. Every Sunday, you tune into Foodie and the Bees because it's DC's only food and wine radio variety show, and we just celebrated 16 years on air. Um, and of course, you follow me at NYCCI, N-E-L-L-I-S, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and Thread, and LinkedIn, and YouTube, because not only can you download this and listen to it as a podcast, but you can also watch it, which is always fun. So. It's so good to be back on air. I did take another little break and there's a reason for that because um, your girl here had some stuff to do. Um, there's so much going on and I've been eating and I've been drinking and I've been emceeing and I've been hanging out with some of the very best and brightest in the industry. So uh, as usual, I'm gonna take you down a little trip of my memory lane on where I've been and what I've been doing and then and only then, I will be bringing on this week's guest, the lovely and always entertaining Joe Yonin. So if you follow me on Insta, you know some of this already, but just hold on tight because it was good. All right. So I was back up in the big city. I know I've been up there a lot recently. And um, this time I had some real like hard work to do. I was asked to MC the 30th anniversary of Nobu. And it was this like ridiculous, insane opportunity. The team at Nobu did not spare any expenses. They laid out this ridiculous party. It was sushi, I mean, obviously, sake and wagyu and tequila. It was a star-studded event. Um, it was at this like pretty fab uh, place called the Glass House. Uh, let's see, I got to introduce Chef Nobu, Robert De Niro, Meyer Tepper for this like great sake ritual, um, while guests like Martha Stewart and Jean-Georges Van Richten and Eric Repair, um, they all raised a glass. I introduced David Foster and Catherine McPhee. They provided the entertainment. Um, and if anybody wants to totally sidebar about David Foster, I'm so happy to go down that rabbit hole with you. Um, I did give away four luxurious trips uh, to different Nobu properties, and I was totally bummed that I did not get the one uh, in Cabo because it sounds amazing. Um, anyway, the whole thing was spectacular, and I'm still kind of soaking in all the fun and glory that it was. Um, but I will tell you that afterwards, even though there was a lot of food, I was up on stage. So I did not eat that much. Uh, and seeing Eric Repair gave me the idea. I was like, oh, I'm going to go sit at the bar at La Bernadette and like do that. So I did. And I totally feasted at the bar at La Bernadette. It so holds up. It never disappoints. And if you haven't been in a minute, please revisit. It is really one of the poshest places in the city. And it's so amazing. Um, and of course, if I'm up in NYC, you know, I'm going to definitely find a way to see a show. Um, so I stayed a little extra, took a couple of meetings, and I got to see Daniel Day Kim's Yellow Face, which also, if you can get up there to see that, it's really terrific. So entertaining, so smart, great, great show. Okay, so I don't have a ton of time, so I can't get into the amazing experience when I dined on the field of Nat Stadium with Jose Andreas and Carla Hall um, and a variety of the other DC great chefs. Um, and I can also get into the luncheon at Jose's house. It was like this massive paella luncheon. Um, you know, Alice Waters was there and Joe Nathan and I'm name dropping. But as you know, because I interviewed Alice Waters a couple of weeks ago, she was in town uh, to receive the Julia Tile Foundation Award. Um, and on my next show with Tony Tipton Martin and Morgan Bowling, I will get into that incredible experience 
as well as Chefs for Equality, which is totally the event of the season, and it was amazing. Okay, well, that was fun to relive, and now on to Joe Yonan. So I think Joe Yonan and I met like, I don't know, like maybe 15 years ago when he first came to DC. I think it was like 15, maybe 18. Anyway, the he came for the Washington Post food section. Now, if you fast forward to today, Joe is a two times James Beard Foundation Award winning food and dining editor at the Washington Post. He is the author of several books, including Cool Beans, Serve Yourself, Eat Your Vegetables, and this book, if you're watching on YouTube, because it is massive, uh, the newly published Mastering the Art of Plant-Based Cooking. It is a guide to better eating. So, hi, Joe. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, 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 hi. I'm like, Thank you so I'm like much. Getting I my you get your workout. Yep, right? Yep. With yep. This so you book. eat and then you work out. <laughs> I, it is gorgeous and I love Thank it. You. So I've Really, um, I kind of want to start and talk about a bunch of things because when I first met you, you were just an eater. <laughs> you were, I mean, you were this fabulous writer, <laughs> but you know, you were from Texas. You ate barbecue. Like this was, mm -hmm. you have jumped, you have jumped into a different space in the, since I've known you. Can we talk about your journey yep. a little bit? Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, you put it, you put it exactly right about where I was. I mean, I grew up uh, in a very barbecue uh, centric uh, culture in West Texas. My brother like showed me how to build one of those, uh, those barbecues that they do out of like a, a steel drum that gets cut in half. Have you ever seen them um, in the yes. South? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was a certified Kansas City competition barbecue judge for several years. Um, but about, I don't know, it was about 12 or 13 years ago, and I had been eating more more and more vegetables, but I didn't quite realize how far I had come until one day I was uh, getting ready to have a dinner party, and I was trying to figure out what to make, and I opened up my freezer, and I noticed, sort of surprised me, that there were, I don't know, 20 or 25 pounds of the most beautiful farmer's market bought, humanely raised, locally raised meats that I hadn't been cooking at home. And I think I was waiting for an excuse to cook them, waiting for somebody to come over. And I think at the beginning, it was sort of uh, eat lean and clean at home because of all the, what, fat and dirty eating I was doing in restaurants, which I'm sure you can uh, identify with. Relate. Um, I relate. I relate. Yep. 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 And then, and then as soon as I realized it... Then I also started realizing, you know, I feel really good. I feel so mm. good. And so I just kind of started moving more in that direction. And it was also around the time that more and more restaurant chefs were doing really interesting things with vegetables. So I was able to sort of, when I was out at restaurants, then I was kind of also cutting back on my meat, just sort of instinctively. Um, I ended up. But can I stop you? Can I stop yeah, you there for yeah, a yeah. second? Because you brought yeah. up something that's really interesting, and that is eating out. I mean, I think for so long, if you were a vegetarian or vegan or gluten free, I mean, any of the things that people are today, dining in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. If you went into a restaurant and you were like, yeah, I'm vegetarian or yeah, I'm vegan. I mean, they give you like either a plate of pasta or, or as I love to bring up our good friend, David Hagedorn, you know, the carrots, like we'll just have the <laughs> right, carrots. Right. So, you know, like there yeah, was a shift, yeah. which I think, did that help absolutely. in your process? Yes, absolutely. It was sort of around the same time. You know, I, I just, there, yeah, at first, a long time ago, it was the mushroom flatbread, right? Or the portobello, maybe there was a portobello burger. Um, that was about right. it. Um, and God forbid two of you came in, like God forbid you dine out with another person with you who wanted to eat vegetarian because you were going to eat the same thing, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But absolutely that helped. And, you know, one of the other things that I think helped so much in D.C. was the small plates revolution. You know, the mm. onset of small plates really broke a lot of chefs out of this mindset that, the only appropriate thing to put in front of people was, you know, your typical meat and two or meat and three, you know, uh, protein. And when I say right. protein, 
course, I mean an animal protein, and a starch and a side, you know. But small plates mm. kind of got chefs to really realize that as long as they make something interesting, you know, it can be, it doesn't have to have any particular thing in it. It can be kind of whatever they want. And so there was a lot more interest being paid to vegetables. And that really helped. And then I, I moved to Maine for a year and um, spent a year with my sister and brother-in-law who grow most of their own food. And then I spent a year eating and cooking like stuff that had been picked 12 feet away. And that pretty much mm -hmm. solidified it for me. And I came back mm -hmm. and sort of quote unquote came out as a vegetarian. <laughs> well, I, have I call it my second coming that. out. <laughs> Your second coming out. Yeah. Cause I call it I'm my so second curious. coming out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love that. Uh, but I'm sort of curious cause I, I don't know if you remember Joan Hisaoka who uh, was uh -huh. a big oh, absolutely. person here in town mm -hmm. who unfortunately passed away, but she mm -hmm. was vegetarian and mm -hmm. she did not tell anybody cause she was in food PR and she was like, right. I cannot tell people. So, what was it like <laughs> sort of sharing that with your team as the food editor of the Washington Post food section? I mean, one of the most nationally read food sections in this country. Yeah. You know, my team was great. My team was, I mean, they had mm -hmm. seen me moving in this direction for a while. To them, it was no surprise. It's mm -hmm. sort of like, you know, your mother, my mother knew that I was gay before I said I was gay. She's like, oh, you're the last to know, okay. right? So my whole team, yeah. you know, my whole team saw it coming. Um, mm -hmm. What was hard were actually a lot of industry people, other food writers, uh, editors, uh, some readers, other, you know, chefs, chefs, sort of a lot of them acted like I had disappointed them. You know, they were like, where did we go wrong? Like, what happened to you? <laughs> like, you used to be fun. Um, <laughs> but they came around, you know, they, they definitely came around. And I think Mm -hmm. I think once they started realizing that it was an interesting challenge to uh, to be needing to come up with something that would satisfy a, a vegetarian, I think they really liked it. I mean, I've gotten, it's been sort of surprising to me, but in the last few years especially, I've gotten more feedback from chefs who've been around a while who've said, you know, you really helped push us toward more vegetarian mm -hmm. dishes in D.C. And I hadn't really quite thought of that. That was when I went out more. I, you know, I'm a, I'm the father I, of a teenager now, so I don't go out anymore. <laughs> well, you got to get that teenager out so that they eat new things right. and try new things. But yes. let me ask you, so with the book, so you've written several books, but mm -hmm. this one really comes at it. I mean, I have all your books and this, and I've interviewed you for, Thank I think, you. two of them. Um, mm -hmm. This one really comes at it in a very different way. And you know, one of the quotes that I really loved in your book was, about can plant-based eating be defined by something other than what is missing, right? Like, right. is that, was that like where you were taking the book from? Like, was that like, this is what's, this is the guide of the book? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I really believe strongly that plant-based cooking is beautiful in and of itself and that that, you know, you don't have to approach it from a place of subtraction, that it can be about addition, like new things that you're making, new styles of cooking, new, new reasons to get excited about cooking. And part of the reason, too, was really that I saw any time there was much written about, about this way of cooking, I felt like it often, the conversation often seemed to just center on the identities. You know, who's better? Is it better to be vegan or vegetarian or eat everything or flexitarian or pescatarian? And what right. I thought was getting lost was just the food itself. And, you know, and I'm interested mm -hmm. in cooking for cooking's sake. And I'm interested in ways to make things delicious. And I just started to realize that this is a cuisine. Like, I want people to think of this as a cuisine. You know, like, you, you, if you want to learn how to make the best Vietnamese fresh spring rolls, right, you don't feel compelled as an American to feel like you have to move to Vietnam, you know, renounce your U.S. citizenship, tell your friends, I'm only, Viet I'm only eating Vietnamese food from now on, you know. You, you can be curious about it. You can, you can read. You can read Andrea Nguyen's really great books. You can watch videos. You can visit, sure. Um, and so, of mm -hmm. course, what I'm getting at is that it's the same thing. You, know, you don't need to call yourself vegan or vegetarian in order to be interested in how to make this kind of food, how to make it beautiful and delicious for whatever reason, for however many meals, for whoever you're cooking for, for whatever reason. 
So that that was the main impetus. Well, I think I, I love that, and I love that, and I think I think there's something. I don't know why vegan scares people. I don't yeah. know why. <laughs> I don't know if it's like lack. I can't decide like why or. Plant based has become more palatable in more ways yes. than one, obviously. But so you put together a whole bunch of writers and cooks in this book. So yes. how did you go about? Because I some I want to get into some of the essays in here because I really love them. Oh, but thank so you. how did you go about sort of putting it together and deciding who you wanted to work with and sort of educate people? Because you're saying mastering the art, like. Like Julia Child, right? Like <laughs> right. mastering. So um, <laughs> I, mean, I see what you did there. Um, so uh, how, like, how, why bring these other people in and use their voices as well? Right, right. Well, one purely practical reason was that I wanted to do it fairly quickly. And the easiest way to do it quickly was to have people working on Think simultaneously. If it had just been me developing recipes, mm -hmm. it would have taken me seven years to write the book. Um, having said that, the other challenge mm -hmm. is I also wanted the book to feel like me. So I did. I, I reached out to a bunch of people that I whose work I admire. They weren't necessarily plant based or vegan or vegetarian at all. Um, some of them are, um, but I knew that they all had facility um, for cooking this way and that they love vegetables and and mm -hmm. that they have interesting things to say. And, and I just had these meetings with them, long Zoom conversations with them where I talked about the philosophy, the guiding principles of the book. And, you know, in addition to brainstorming recipe ideas, I asked them, like, what do you think needs to be in a book like this? Like, what would you want to see? Mm -hmm. And that helped me inform. You know, it's I, I know so many really smart people. It, it just didn't make sense for me to, you know, just be in my own head about it all the time. I needed to... I needed to to cast around and and the conversations were so dynamic and they're so talented and the and I gave so much direction and brainstorm about the recipes that when everything came back it also the funny thing is that it also felt like I could have written it all um, it, but again it would have taken me seven years you know so uh, it right, was right. it was one one of the most challenging parts of the process but also probably the most gratifying because I love collaborating I love working with people there's so such mm -hmm. smart people out there and it. it it just, I don't know. I felt like we all made each other better. Well, I think not recreating the wheel is always a good thing, right? Yeah. And I love yeah. that you, and I mean, in fact, in, um, cause I'm interviewing Tony Timpton Martin oh, later. Oh, she's great. With, yeah. uh, oh my God, I love her. And with yes. uh, Morgan Bowling. Uh, and um, their book is also features, you know, recipes and other That's writers right. and other points of view on a singular topic. So it's, yeah. and it's also a massive book. So I mean, yes. <laughs> I really a appreciate sort of the community that you're creating mm -hmm. by sharing the story that way. Um, so before we get into the essays, because I am I really love the essay uh, by uh, Nico Vera about oh, the yeah. colonization of food. I really want to go down that rabbit hole a little bit. But I want to sort of talk people through plant-based eating, right? Because sure. I think for some people, plant-based eating is, they're like, oh, it's just going to be carb, sugars and carbs, right? <laughs> like if you're thinking that way, right? Like right, it's going to be right. beans, pasta, and, you know, high sugar. So, right. I mean, that's one thing that people think of. And then the other thing is given the um, growth of the uh, of people who are eating plant based, of course, there's people who want to make money off of it because you can't make any money that much money off of vegetables, but you can make money off of processed foods. So now right. there's <laughs> tons of plant based processed foods, which seems to be the antithesis of eating a plant based diet. Um, so how do you, do you go about like sort of structuring your book to like make a pathway for people to understand? 
Yeah, no, it's an excellent question. Um, there's so many ways into this and, um, you know, I'm not a nutritionist, so I didn't want to, uh, pretend that, um, you know, every recipe that I was going to give you this, you know, complete diet that helped meet your dietary needs. I wanted to concentrate on the culinary aspects and on how to make it delicious. But at the same time, you know, I, mm -hmm. I wanted the recipes to feel like they're satisfying and and they're interesting and they're delicious and that they're not create they're not horribly bad for you of course um there is a risk when you eat plant-based and i think when i first started i was more like this of becoming a carbitarian as we call ourselves and i love carbs and i always will and i love a carb on carb dish um i do you know, too potatoes on pizza um but <laughs> Yeah, I love it. I love it. But, you know, I also want to celebrate the actual vegetables. So I didn't want to just have things that I think this I think a lot of that is solved by not coming at it from this sense of subtraction that we were talking about earlier. If you come at it from a sense of subtraction, mm -hmm. then I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, you can eat you can eat pasta with with olive oil and garlic and chili flakes and it's delicious, you know. But if I want to celebrate a vegetable, um, and be adding something, mm -hmm. then then things get a lot more interesting and a lot more creative. So so I think by you know think about it as a as as a as having a sense of abundance, and and also thinking a lot about texture and mm -hmm. and and color really mm -hmm. really can help um, with a lot of that. I mean, largely, I also I also just thought about the ways in which I think people want to eat and the way I like to eat. And I divided the, the cookbook up accordingly. Yeah, I think you give people a real like yellow brick road on, you know, putting it on the plate. Let's I mean, because you did <laughs> no, break it up, you know, like <laughs> breakfast and brunch and pizza breads and more and main dishes, you know, you made mm -hmm. it uh, really um, easy to sort of walk through and understand. Um, although I'm sure like the non vegans look at breakfast and brunch and be like, where are my eggs at? You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I think <laughs> right, learning right. how to <laughs> not feel that lack. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I could do without anything. I really can except for one thing. It's just one thing. I, I don't know how it's cheese. You're cheese, say cheese is my problem. <laughs> I eat mass quantities of You're gonna cheese. You're going to say cheese. I did say I cheese. Knew, cheese. Knew. Cheese is my problem. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I saw it coming. Cheese is my. <laughs> You're not I alone. Not, you are not yeah, alone. I'm sure you did. Um, but I don't feel like you're a diehard. I think you're like, so eat cheese. Like if you want cheese, eat cheese, right? That's right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So I, I often tell the story about how at events, someone mm -hmm. will always inevitably come up to me at the end and they'll get real close and they'll drop their voice down to a whisper and they'll say, I really want to be a vegetarian or vegan, but I'm just afraid that every now and then I'm going to want to have a steak. And I always do the same thing. I lower my voice to match theirs and I say, here's what you do. Become a vegetarian and every now and then have a steak. <laughs> and they always just, they can't believe that I'm giving them this permission right. and they can't believe that I would say this. But the point is like draw the lines and the boundaries wherever they work for you, wherever they work for you. If you try to adopt some artificial outside imposed, you know, definition of your diet, I think it's not sustainable. So whatever, it, whatever you can do to, to have a sustainable diet that includes eating more vegetables, more plants, that's what I, that's what I think is the most important. And I think that that is the most important, right? Like, why do we, why do we make, it's eating. Why do we make it so hard on ourselves, right? It's a pleasure. Right. It's a gift that we can right. nourish ourselves and um, enjoy it this way, right? Okay, right. let's get into That's the book a little right. bit more. So let's, let's start with uh, decolonizing your diet. Um, I thought mm -hmm. this was a very interesting essay. It's Nico Vera. Um, because they did not take a hard stance. They gave us the history of what happens when 
other people come into your culinary world and change how food is processed or how food is a eaten um, uh, or created, you know, like the addition of limes from Spain to the ceviches of Peru, right? right. But keeping right. the integrity. So what, why was that article so important to your book? I really wanted to remind people that there's not this huge disconnect between plant-based eating and traditional diets around the world. That's, that's really what I was after. And I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of misconceptions about a lot of diets. People think, oh, you could never have, uh, you could never come from a Mexican American family and, and eat a plant-based diet without completely renouncing, you know, the foods of your culture and your heritage. And the fact is the easiest way for someone who's of a Mexican heritage to eat a plant-based diet and feel like they're connected to their culture is to reach farther back um, mm. to the to the culture that existed before before they were colonized and before colonization you know the the traditional diets of that part of the world there they weren't completely vegan there there was hunting you know there were some animals used very sparingly to supplement but the bulk of the diet was plant-based. Um, and I just find that mm -hmm. to be something really important to remind people of so that they don't feel like there's there's this big disconnect. It kind of reminds me of like the Korean vegan who's wonderful, Joanne Molinaro, who um, I also worked with on some recipes in the book. You know, she writes about Buddhist, the Buddhist temple traditions of Korea which are all plant-based. And, and it's the same thing. You know, when she first went vegan, she thought, oh, well, there goes there goes my Korean food. Like I can't, I can't right. be around my family. I can't eat Korean food with my family. No, no. She actually had a roadmap for how to eat plant-based food that felt like it was connected to her culture. And I just wanted to remind people of that. So they didn't feel like, you know, plant-based eating is just modern American bastardization of different global cuisines, which it kind of can, can seem to be, I think sometimes. Well, actually, her essay was the second one I wanted to bring up. Oh, oh cool. Because <laughs> uh, I thought what Joanne had to say was really important. We have these, what we think are our culinary histories based on how we grow up, but you really have to look way further in the past to connect That's to... Right. Um, to the histories, right? To to not That's how right. your parents ate or how your grandparents ate, but how how the ancestors ate. And that's, I, I that's thought it was exactly fascinating. Right. It was a really interesting take. Oh, I'm um, so I'm well, so glad you liked it. Let's get into the book and some of the recipes. Sure. Oh, I loved it. I, I mean, the essays are Thank really you. they add so much context, um, not just to how we eat every day, but. I think it, it's important for people to be introspective mm -hmm. about what what's coming on your plate and mm -hmm. how it got there. Um, mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of the recipes. Who were you talking to, like when you were doing breakfast and brunch or pizza breads and more, like and your main dishes, like what were you looking to have in there? What what were some of the recipes in here that you were like? This is how I, this is how I cook for my son. This is how I cook for my husband. This is how we cook together. This is my Sunday dinner. What were the things that you were putting in here that you were like, this is a look into my life? Oh, interesting, interesting question. Um, well, I I cook. I'm Middle Eastern, and I grew up in Texas, mm -hmm. and I've traveled you know, widely. And I've traveled a lot in Mexico for my years in Texas. I adore Mexican cooking. Um, I've never been to India, but I'm obsessed with Indian cooking. Um, and, and I've been to uh, the Far East, and I have a huge love of Japanese cooking. So, oh, and, and, and how can I, mm. how can I forget uh, Spanish and Italian and French cooking? You know, I went to culinary school that was run mm -hmm. by an Italian woman. Um, and I sort of think Italian food for the longest time wasn't, was sort of integrated into most Americans' ways of cooking. So um, I would say the dishes that speak the most, the kinds of foods that speak the most to how I cook at home are, are things that have some Middle Eastern touches like 
like the hot, like, uh, like different dips and there's, there's, um, you know, a, a really, oh, you know, what my, one of my favorites is, is the broccoli tabbouleh. Um, because Mm. that's a direct reference to my heritage, a tabbouleh, a real tabbouleh that's not Americanized Mm -hmm. is a parsley salad, not a grain salad. And it's mostly parsley and bulgur is the grain. And it's not mostly bulgur with like a little bit of Mm -hmm. parsley in it. So I felt like broccoli would be a really fun thing to use instead of parsley. And it didn't, and it, and because, because Mm -hmm. it's not a grain salad, it felt almost more quote unquote authentic. And I kind of hate to use that word, but more respectful, I should say of the tradition than if I had changed out, Mm. you know, the grain. Um, So I love that one. Mm. Um, You know, when it comes to dinner time, I'm a big fan pasta man i mean my teenager loves pasta that's the quickest way to a 16 year old's heart i feel like (laughs) um if especially if you're not feeding them meat you know i mean his favorite meal is is wings and fries and lemonade that's you know when he gets takeout that's what he wants you know but he also loves a big bowl of pasta so that's one of those places where i know that i can bring my love for vegetables in and i can maybe get him to eat more of it i'm not sneaking things in really but it's just that because the pasta is so hearty and and it's just all so great he and it's familiar to him i think familiarity is a really important thing and that's one of the things that i mentioned when i talk about for instance, why I have recipes in the book that make references to animal products. You know, I mean, there's, there, mm-hmm. there is certainly this debate, and, and we talked about it a little bit at the, at the beginning. I don't want things to feel like subtractions, and I don't want things to feel like replacements. But our culture has featured animal products in our food for a long time, and I think it's impossible to escape all references to them. So... I think the plant-based cooking, plant-based mm-hmm. kitchen can be kind of playful. So also the dishes that really speak to me that are in the book that are really feel like me are the ones that are kind of, um, that have a playfulness about them. Like I'll say the Romanesco Romesco. Um, now that's a whole roasted cauliflower. Mm-hmm. It's a Romanesco cauliflower and it's on Romesco sauce. And it's a great combination, but right? I'm a word I'm a word guy, and I thought it was just hilarious to do Romanesco Romesco, and that's something that I'm mm-hmm. just into. Like in my last book, I I worked for years to get a cannellini cannelloni to work, and it was just because I wanted to be able to se- call something a cannellini cannelloni. It just makes me laugh. I crack myself up, and that's me. Um, I will say, as somebody who loves alliteration, since my name is Nikki Nellis, I do totally understand (laughs) where you're coming from on that. (laughs) So I do get it. Uh, So listen, tell me a little bit about, like, are you on the book circuit? Are you doing talks? Like, where can people sort of see you more and, and hear more about this from you? Yeah. Um, well, I did my main swing of the book tour um, already. I just finished up in California. I did some things in D.C. Um, at Sixth and I, which was really fun. Um, and now I'm 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 doing a lot of podcasts because I love audio. Thank you very much. Um, and people can hear me there. I think the best way is probably to follow me on social media where I'm you know, mm-hmm. posting links to things, uh, my Instagram, uh, particularly, um, I don't have a lot of events in DC still planned. Um, but some stuff will come up. Some stuff is coming up. Um, okay, New York, we'll probably posted. in November. Yeah, absolutely. will. Great. I will make sure that you put it on the list always. Yes, it'll be on or the I'll list. Ask. All right. Well, I want to thank you so <laughs> much, Joe Yoden for joining me today. Mastering sure. the art of plant-based cooking. It is recipes, tips, and techniques. It It's not, what I love about your book, honestly, and I'm not blowing smoke, is that, well, yeah, there are amazing recipes in here. I like to read a cookbook like I read a book, right? And the, um, yeah. I think the, that's always very appealing to me because I'm learning 
about somebody else's journey, you know, no different than reading a memoir. It's like a, right. a bunch of people's memoirs. Do you know what I mean? And I, exactly. I really enjoy that. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. I don't get to see you as much anymore, but it is I good know. to see you. I want to thank all of you for joining me today. Don't forget, you can find me at N-Y-C-C-I-N-E-L-L-I-S on all the social media platforms. If you're listening to the show and you want to see how handsome Joe Yonan is, then please watch us on YouTube, subscribe and like. And of course, you can always DM me on any of those social media channels with any questions you have. There is so much going on out there and it's all delicious. You don't want to miss a bite. We'll see you next week. Produced by HeartCast Media.